I know. I want to say I'm right now. I'm 88. I know. <laughs> which is quite an antiquitous age. It's a great age. Yeah. Very few people use words like antiquitous. Mm -hmm. That's a great word. <laughs> no one has ever used that word in all of our conversations. You're free to use it, you know. I have used it before, and I will say antiquitous <laughs> one more time. But can you talk a little bit about what you remember growing up, and how? And what was it like growing up? Was it a, an interesting city? I mean, I, I don't know. I'm not from here. Well, first of all, I was brought up in Hamilton in this general neighborhood. I was, I lived when I was born, I guess. I wasn't born here, because I was born in a hospital. But, or they called them something else in those days. There were, uh, I, I, I think my mother and father always pointed out to me where I was born. It wasn't a hospital, but it was like, almost like a nursing home. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, I lived just down the street from this about uh, two or three blocks. And I've lived here all my life except when I went to university and during the war. So I really know this place pretty well, but the thing I have memories of more than anything else are milk wagons and bread wagons with horses. Is that right? That sounds silly. Not at all. But the... Do, do you remember if any Jewish people delivered milk or sold bread? No, there were, I, I think there were certain occupations that uh, were, and you didn't meet any Jewish people at all, and that would be one of them. And uh, not to belittle the people who s s had bread wagons and milk wagons, uh, it was just that people fell into niches in those days, I think much more so than today. I think most of the Jewish people feel the world is open to them. If they want to go into this, they'll go into this. So it has, it has proved to be that way. Do you, do you remember any occupations that were not so open to Jews as? Well, there were loads of comments in those days about the whole engineering field was closed to Jewish people. And, and I think that was a natural thing in a way because many people in engineering didn't come in contact with Jewish people. They never knew them. The biggest trick is to get to know people. Once you know people, you find all people are the same. Law was, was more accessible? Well, I took law after the war. And uh, I was like a lot of people. I was completely lost, didn't know what to do. I regarded it necessary to find some path of discipline. And so I went to law school, never really intending to practice law. I thought it would be interesting. And once I got into it, you're in the flow and away you go. Were there a number of Jewish lawyers in Hamilton when you graduated? I wouldn't say there were a number, not like there are today, no, no, no. People, people believed the propaganda that was existing about Jewish people couldn't get into it. It was like university. It was hard for Jewish people to get into a straight university course years ago. Because they're, they're, obviously there are prejudices. They're there. People don't like to hear it, but there, there were. There were prejudices about what Jewish people were like? Oh, sure, sure. There was a stereotype of Jewish people, and... Uh, and the stereotype was what? Well, I'm not even going to repeat it, because it's, uh, it's not fair. It's not fair to even repeat those things, I don't think. But the, those stereotypes weren't overwhelmingly favorable. No, no, that's a very conservative approach and description. At the same time, I mean, uh, Jews weren't the only group that were stereotyped. That's the truth. Foreign-born children, children of foreign-born parents, uh, Italians, Greeks, etc., were all in the same boat. We learned this when we went to university and came in contact with all these people. Everybody had the same experiences with prejudice. As you grow up in, uh, in Hamilton, are there any 
um, Jewish institutions with which you connect? No, I was a non-joiner. Always was a non-joiner. The more people would join something, the less I'd be inclined to be attracted to it. It's just a, some sort of a characteristic I have. I don't. I was always very independent. But but uh, um, but but people who came into contact with you must have known that you were Jewish. With the name Goldberg, I don't know, and yet I had people straight to my face say to me when I was in the Air Force, particular, they'd be interviewing me for something, and they say, "Now we get down to things like uh, religion, etc. What religion do you belong to?" And I just about dropped through the floor. How they couldn't figure out I was Jewish was always amazing to me, but. People in the other world don't live quite like we who are in that other world live. You soon learn that. Exactly, exactly. And um, um, so you're growing up in Hamilton in when? In, in the 40s? Oh no, way before the 40s. I'm, I, I'm, I'm, this would be the 1920s and 30s. See, the 1930s, I mean, there are signs people report that made it clear that Jews were not welcome here or there. Some of the signs, some claim, would say, no Jews or dogs allowed. Yes, yes. Do you ever remember seeing any such signs? No. Did no, you I... heard about them? Oh, yes, of course. That always outraged people who thought with their minds instead of their emotions. It was a terrible thing. Sure, of course there were prejudices, but those prejudices weren't exclusive to just the Jewish people. They went right on to people who were, had foreign-born parents who, who spoke English with an accent. That was one of the really telltale indicators that people were of another group, another race, which wasn't necessarily true. But nevertheless, people, people are prejudiced. They are, and I'm afraid that they're always going to be, but there's some enlightenment today. Whether it's a pseudo-enlightenment, I don't know, you see. I, that's the thing we'll never know. Well. In 20 years from now, when we come back, you let us know. If, I'll let you know. If, if you think that uh, it's pseudo or if it's, if it's real. I, I don't know. Yeah. I'm afraid you're talking to a chap who doesn't have the answers. Well, maybe not with respect to prejudice. Yeah. But, uh, but we don't have, there, there are no right or wrong answers uh, to, to what we're doing. But even if you don't join um, any, if you're not actively involved in many Jewish institutions, was your family connected with any particular synagogue? My father always told me that he was the first person, or Jewish person, who was bar mitzvahed at the Beth Jacob Synagogue in the old days, when it was called the Hunter Street Shul. And uh, he goes back a long ways. And my grandfather, whom I vaguely remember, I only remember him because he had a very imposing beard. And, uh, but both grandparents died quite early on in my life. They, 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 we don't see the picturesque form of life with all the family and the grand parents. I have just a vague memory of my grandparents. So, so he, your father claimed that he was the first yeah. to have been bar mitzvah at the, uh, at, at the Beth Jacob. Beth so, Jacob. So was that a synagogue to which your family went? Or, or? My family 
were divided. My father was a conformist of the old school, and he used to go to the synagogue at Beth Jacob, and my mother <laughs> went to Aunt Shisholem, which was the reform. And uh, that's how I was brought up. I would go over and see my father at one, <laughs> and my mother at the other. Is that right? I always thought it was semi-ridiculous, which it was. <laughs> But that's life. Some would have thought that it was totally ridiculous, let alone semi. That, well, uh, totally is more accurate, <laughs> I agree. 1948, uh, the State of Israel is, uh, is, is established. Do you remember if that made an impression on any Jews in the city? That's going back a long ways, even 50-some years now. Well, see, I can't speak for the impressions of other people. I can only talk about my own impressions. Precisely. Yeah, I, I, I remember when it happened, and uh, it was almost a feat beyond description because you never, no one had ever thought that was going to happen. A lot of people dreamt about it happening, and they were zealous. Uh, what would you call them? Uh, well, a lot of people thought that Pal Palestine was the homeland. Sure. Yeah. Sure. You know, in 19, uh, um, 1930, when was the riot in Christie Pitts? 1933. In 1933, there was a. I remember the Crystal Christie Pitts. The Christie Pitts. Riot, and we, we uh, my colleague and I tried to speak to some guy, uh, non-Jewish guy. He refused to speak to us. And we said, well, do you have any friends that we can talk to about, about the swastika clubs that sprang up in Toronto? And he said, no, my friends are all buried in Europe, which he said is more than I can say for the other side. And this was his way of saying that, whereas he and his friends were very patriotic Canadians, the Jews were not. But you ended up being a pilot mm -hmm. in the Air Force. How'd you get to do that? I just decided I was going to be a pilot. I always thought I would like to fly. And uh, when the war broke out, I decided to join the Air Force. And uh, they fiddled around for a long time. It wasn't easy to get into the Air Force in those days. Uh, I don't really know the history of the Air Force. When you joined the Air Force in the old days, you became a pilot officer if you were going to go for air crew. And uh, that seemed to attract a lot of people and discourage a lot of people. People didn't like to have rank and responsibility. And I was always one of those people who felt that if it was going to be done, I'd like to do it because I like to take the responsibility for doing it. I think I had faith in my own spirit of responsibility. It's hard sure. to describe. Sure. So you became a pilot. Yeah. Were, were there were you the only Jewish pilot with whom you came into contact, or were there others in the Air Force oh. from Hamilton? Oh, oh I, I, I don't think I, I was going to say ever. Seldom did I bump into any Jewish people from Hamilton. In the Air Force? In the Air Force, yeah. yeah. Not just that the, 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 there were a number who were in the Army and other, you know, but the Air Force was a little different. And uh, it's hard to look back to those days of innocence, you know. I, 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 I've often thought about it. It's hard to put your finger on. But it must have been quite uh, an achievement for a young Jewish male to have become a pilot in the Air Force. I mean, this, this must have gotten some play within the Jewish community, wouldn't you think? 
you would know. I mean, I but you see, they weren't as wise in those days, public relations way. They didn't think ahead too much about these things. You floated along with the situation. And sure, there was always prejudice. There's always been prejudices. But the, I, I learned later in life and uh, that a lot of people felt that way about prejudice in Canada. People, as I say, who were, whose fathers and mothers came over from Europe, who spoke with an accent. They right. weren't fully accepted. But my, my, my thinking, I might be wrong, my, my thinking is that if I were living in Hamilton, when, when you became a pilot, then, then I would have met people within the Jewish community who would have said, Goldberg is a pilot in the Air Force. I mean, it was, it was, it was a mark of real accomplishment, not only for you as an individual, but Jews felt that, you know, here we are contributing. Well, whether they all felt that way or any of them felt that way, I can't say. But were your achievements not recognized by the Jewish community in any formal way? Oh, I think I had my quota of respect and whatnot from the Jewish community. I don't think there's any doubt about that. But... Uh, I, I'm not trying to avoid your question. I'm really trying to come to grips with it. Right. Who, who ran the Jewish community? Do you remember any names of people who, who seemed to be the leaders of the Jewish community around, you know, in the early 40s? Do any names come to mind? Who is the guy who ran the station or something? Ken Sobel. Oh, oh Ken Sobel happens to have been a client of mine. Here we go. Yeah, here we go. He was a very fine guy and very very much at the head of things. He, he, he had the first uh, television license, one of the first to have a radio transmitting license in, in Hamilton. He, he was a man ahead of his time and he was a very fine guy. I was very fond of him. You could talk directly to him, no nonsense. He, he, he left a great mark in the city, I think. But there were still people prepared to uh, uh, be critical. I mean, he was... Uh, you, how, you, can't, you can't be well known and not be criticized. It's, it's pretty impossible. We, uh, we heard from uh, Norm Levitt that you were a bit of a hero in the war. Can you tell us about your, that, what he was mentioning, what, what he was referring to? What? You know the story. Pardon? You know the story. You know the story. What's the story? The shot, in, shot down, escape, French underground. Oh, well, I had a lot of dramatic experiences. That, that's true. I mean, I, I, I was shot down and uh, uh, lived with the underground in, in, in Europe and uh, managed to get over the Pyrenees into Spain, out to Gibraltar. And uh, I guess that was quite a feat in those days. It would be a feat today. But probably, yeah. Probably. Absolutely. Let me just point out, when, when you say you were shot down, what, you lost control of the airplane? The airplane is shot? The airplane was shot by ground fire. How'd you get out? By parachute? No, uh -oh. I, I, I was one of these people who had great confidence in his ability as a pilot. And I never liked the idea of bailing out. It was very difficult to bail out of something like a Spitfire. It was quite a feat in itself. And uh, so I had made my decision long before that, that if anything ever happened to me, I would do my damnedest to come down with the aircraft. I felt more secure in the aircraft, even though 
it was shot up and it was r running on a couple of cylinders, I always felt more confident at those controls, even though the controls weren't necessarily working. It, it, it's a uh, it's hard it's hard to get this where, point. Where of, do you land? Like in the airport in Paris? No, 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 no. You pick a field out in the country. Really? Yes. One that appears to be level. One that appears to be level. And that is a great problem too, because what appears at a certain number of thousand feet and in fact occurs is are two different things. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You've got to be you've got to be a fatalist to be a flyer. You have to be. And I think I was. So you were shot down in the daytime? I was shot down in the daytime. And where was this field that you landed in? In France. And so what happened? The plane, you, you somehow landed and then what happened? I landed and within about uh, Fifty, sixty minutes or so, forty-five minutes. German troops were scouring the fields. They got to me very quickly, and I was the most surprised man in the world. I wasn't picked up right then and there, and uh, but I, I wasn't. That was a fluke. Uh, I used to give the odd lecture on uh, evasion and escape. Uh, you know, evasion is when you're never caught and you evade being caught. Escaping is another thing because the escapers are people who are caught and escape. There's a big difference. And uh, where so am I? So you escaped. You, you did not evade. I, I, I ev yes, you could escape without evading. Yeah, that's right. You could escape without evading. But nevertheless, I have the highest regard for people who escape and for people who evade. Yeah, I mean, and there's a lot of fate playing its part in this sort of thing, you oh. know. It only takes one person to come up to you and nail you as it were. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So they never found you, and then what happened? You went to where? I got in with the underground, the Maquis. Did you speak French? Pardon? Did you speak French? No. Oh, and I always regretted that I didn't speak French. I had to take Spanish when I was in school. But uh, it's an amazing thing that I learned very early on. You do not have to speak a person's language to be understood. It's amazing what you can do with gestures and your hands and so on. It's incredible. Sure. Yeah. There's a lot of commonality among people, more so than people believe. Uh, I mean, Wendy will enjoy hearing me digress, but yeah. I just want to tell you a story. My mother did not speak French, and the French Canadian farm woman did not speak English. But when they spent 20 minutes with one another, my mother would come back into the house and she would report on what happened to this woman's family over the course of the year. And, and uh, again, my mother mm -hmm. didn't speak French, so I think you're absolutely right. One can understand people yeah. without knowing their, their language. I mean, all the time I, when I'd been shot down, I was wandering around places like, uh, you know, small places, and then even in, I was in Paris for quite a while. Uh, people are people the world over. Really? You yeah. Were, you were in Paris during the occupation. You were in Paris just the other day. Were you in Paris during the occupation by the Germans? Oh yes. Were you? Did you have any fear? Like here you were a Canadian, but you were Jewish. Did you have any fear that your Jewish identity would be discovered? Of course. That was the key to the whole thing. And uh, no matter where you went, you go to the movies, you know, 
they would have a lot of propaganda about people who were Jewish. And uh, of course, it was a great fear. Well, what were you doing in Paris at the time? Were you still with the French underground when you were there? Yes. Oh, yes. They were in the process of trying to get me out. Did they know you were Jewish? Oh, yes. Indeed. This is being very scary. Oh, of course it's scary, but you can't let the situation overcome everything else. You have to you have to, you, you, you have to play your cards right, but I don't take credit for it because we had some very clever and brave people at the top levels advising us on these things. How did you get out and where did did they try to get you out of France? Yes. How did, how did they do that? Well, I finally got out of France by going down to just, I finally walked over the Pyrenees. Mm 